the 35 greatest Africans to ever live. He was announced by the BBC, by Time Magazine, and by President William Jefferson Clinton in the White House as one of the fathers of the internet. I encourage you to go on the internet to read about him and also to read a lecture that he has posted there. Coming from poverty and being a four-time dropout of high school, he developed himself from his poverty developed the courage to earn all of his degrees from the most reputable institutions, including the PhD from the University of Michigan. He did the mathematical computations to sufficiently convince a number of experts that his work was necessary to be considered for the creation of the supercomputer. When we put this program together, changing Religious Emphasis Week to Spiritual Awareness Week, and then adding science, it was based on a number of ideas that we were learning about, like this one from Einstein. That religion without science is blind, and science without religion is lame. We are all aware that the greatest struggles, difficulties, and challenges that we have are a result of divided knowledge, separatism. It is clear to many people who push interdisciplinary learning that the solutions to many of these problems will come to us as a result of unified knowledge, of getting out of our watertight and airtight boxes of isolation. He who never travels thinks his mother is the best cook. It's very important for you to understand that specialization can create vices. But learning to appreciate the unity of wisdom and that the wisdom of the world isn't confined simply to the great books of the Western world. There is an Eastern world. And in light of global warming, it's very important that we take an interest in cosmology. We can no longer be concerned only about our state, our nation, our region, or even the world. We must be concerned about the universe and the cosmos. We must get out of our boxes. And we must learn to appreciate integration in relation to separatism. Mr. Iwagwale's background and how he got from poverty to the Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel and delivering a lecture in Paris on science and spirituality for the Templeton Foundation, the foundation most interested in the interface of religion and science is a story that only he can tell. And I'm going to give you an assignment, Mr. Ethan Wally. I want you, before you speak, to introduce yourself. Give us a little autobiography about yourself and how you were able to make this incredible trip out of poverty to having many experts declare that you're the one of the 35 greatest Africans to ever live. Come on up. And while he's in route, let me remind you that he's being honored with nine others on Friday morning as a part of our 40th anniversary of commemorating the assassination of Dr. King. We're gonna unveil his oral portrait and that portrait is going to be placed with others in our Science Hall of Honor in David Magnet Bay. This is your doctor at Iwagwale.
So my autobiography, so I'll talk about this uh, later towards the end. Once upon a time, there was a genius who began programming supercomputers at an early age. As a teenager, he wrote a million lines of code for the most powerful supercomputers. As an adult, he invented a mega supercomputer and installed it in a sports stadium. He fed the supercomputer the wisdom of our four years and named it Deep Thought. The genius invited world leaders to a grand unveiling. After an eloquent speech, Louding the power of deep thought, this great wizard requested that a revered mathematician ask the machine one of the gold ring problems that had stumped generations of mathematicians. Within seconds, deep thought spat out the correct answer. The wizard Sitting like a king on his throne, smiled with satisfaction. He gently urged other dignitaries to pose the most profound questions. The audience held their breath as the supercomputer correctly answered them all. Finally, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, cleared his throat and asked, is there a God? The wizard turned to deep thought apprehensively. The supercomputer walked away, its lights flashing. Hours passed, then days. Days turned into months. There was no answer. After a year, it finally produced an error message. I lack the data to answer this question. The stadium erupted in laughter as everyone mocked at this genius supercomputer that didn't know if God existed. Flavagaster, the great wizard, commanded his programmers to interface his machine with all the computers in all the homes and offices in the world. Is there a God? He asked again. After a second year of continuous calculations, the supercomputer blinked. Still not enough power. Confounded, the chief programmer ordered the machines be connected to every remaining microprocessor. Thus upgraded, deep thought became omniscient and was held as the mother of all mega supercomputers. Is there a God? The genius programmer cried in exasperation. A booming voice answered. Now there is. I share this story with you for three reasons. First, we are actually constructing a planet sized supercomputer that is a fortress with miles of wires and zillions of parts. Second, our descendants will ask it the most profound questions. Tom, I believe that such a supercomputer is the perfect metaphor to gain insight into the relationship 
between science and spirituality. Can a mega supercomputer prove the existence of God and help us understand the blueprint of our spiritual nature? Yes, if it helps identify and understand the connection point between each human and the super being that is comprised of all living entities. My hypothesis is this, is that we are tiny beings who exist within a planet-sized super being. When we infuse our spirituality or life into the being, we become a mortal. Our lives form an unbroken chain that extends to eternity. We are all part of a living web that covers the earth. If we consider time as the fourth dimension, our collective lives form an unbroken chain in a four dimensional space time continuum that began three and a half billion years ago as an embedded consciousness that continually converted matter and energy into organic material. My hypothesis about a super being must be verifiable to increase the body of scientific knowledge. It should generate predictions or explain phenomena that have occurred without our notice. We are, caught, we are on a journey through eternity, and our conversion and growth will continue until the death of the sun or beyond. We are merely one leg of a long intergenerational relay race. The baton has been passed to us. The baton which ha that has been passed to us is the custodianship of our children. Our job is not to cross the finish line. It is to pass the baton to the next generation. For an Olympic relay runner, the most anguishing, anguishing thing is to drop the baton. Do we want to be remembered as the generation that blundered? We have, we are in an imminent danger of losing our grasp on the battle. Proved by the ravages of racism, poverty, war, and pollution. Religion is based on faith. Science is based on reason. As a scientist, I believe we are more than many humans existing apart from other beings. I am a supercomputer scientist. The supercomputer has been the beacon that guides computer scientists into the future. Thus, I am often asked, who invented the internet? According to the book, History of the Internet, about 100 people at different times and places invented the internet. That is, the internet has 100 fathers, mothers, aunts, and uncles. The internet was not born in a single place or at a single time. It grew organically and incrementally, following trails that intersected with little rhyme or reason. My trail, as explained in History of the Internet, in Time Magazine, and on CNN, was that I hypothesized a planet-sized supercomputer, which in hindsight is an idealized or theorize the internet. But 
what I was hypothesizing was not a planet sized supercomputer or internet. It was a planet sized super being. And my reasoning was that we are more than many humans who exist separately from other beings. I began my investigation. I began by investigating the possibility of interconnected 65,000 computers around the world. But the overall idea was that a mega supercomputer can be a metaphor for living entities who through continuous interaction become the central brain of a planet-sized sphere suspended in the air and seen from outer space. This central brain is nourished and defined by the Earth's atmosphere, oceans, and groundwater. This living organism has its own aggregate intelligence. This brain has a universal desire to break free of the Earth's gravity and enshroud the Moon, Mars, and any habitable planet. The search for life on planets in distant solar system has gained a tremendous following in recent years. However, the true frontier is not outer space. It is inner, earthly space. The space within and between we humans. In reviewing the three and a half and a half billion years since life began first appeared on Earth, we can see there has been a self-directed evolution towards greater complexity and a higher collective intelligence. In a four-dimensional time-space continuum, we are one Earth-sized entity whose cells comprise all entities that ever lived. They are connected by the umbilical cord of our genetic history. Animals and plants are not unrelated beings. Species coexist, interact and learn from each other, creating an incredible, incredibly vast web of life. A biological plot that clothes the earth. Advances in technology will enable humanity to possess superpowers as our 6.6 billion humans learn to communicate. The supercomputer is more about communication than computation. The supercomputer and the internet combine computation and communication into a congruent whole, like the two sides of a coin. One cannot exist without the other. Similarly, I believe that humanity is a tiny portion of living things that affect the whole, with both simultaneously co-evolving. I had an epiphany in the 1980s. I realized that computation is like the ocean and communication is like waves. Waves emanate from the ocean but are different. Similarly, waves of computation swell out of the ocean of communication as both move forward through time. 
Our image of the future inspires the present, and the present creates the future. Today's supercomputer will become tomorrow's ordinary computer, and the internet will become our shared planet size brain. One day, individuals will, will become nodes on the internet, and the internet as we know it today will become obsolete, disappearing into our collective memory. So, as the computers evolve into one supercomputer, and that supercomputer evolves into one internet, that internet becomes humanity. Eventually, all that will remain will be a super brain, a gigantic electronic organic web covering the earth. The nodes will be embedded in an interconnected network of, network of humanity, all working as one. We are redesigning ourselves without realizing it. We have embarked on a self-propelled evolutionary journey in which we are both the creator and the created. Already, we have embedded our consciousness and intelligence into computers. Eventually, we will succeed in embedding our computers into our brains. The computer will be inside us rather than next to us. When technology merges with biology, cyborgs, part man, part machine, will be a real part of our lives. I will be designing ourselves as cyborgs we want to become instead of allowing nature to take its course. We are at a fork in the road. We are two signposts of our direction, science and spirituality. We risk becoming like a cyborg that stopped at, a, at an intersection and asked a pedestrian, where does this road lead? Where do you want to go? The pedestrian asked. I don't know, it replied. Then it obviously doesn't matter which road you take, said the pedestrian. It is important that we humans not blindly choose between science and spirituality. In fact, it is absolutely imperative that we fuse the two together. The computer as we know it today will become obsolete, its place eventually taken by a mega supercomputer. Do we need a mega supercomputer to answer the question, is there a God? Indeed, would it even be capable? One thousand years from now, this story will be told. Once upon a time, a mega supercomputer was designed to answer the question, is there a God? It took 1,000 years for the supercomputer to come up with an answer, love. There was laughter, dancing and jubilation as everyone cried, the answer is love, the answer is love. Someone asked, if the answer is love, what was the question? There was a harsh silence. The supercomputer was asked, love is the answer, but what was the question? After another thousand 
years of calculating, the supercomputer came up with the question How can we live together in peace? I thank the president of All House College, Robert Michael Franklin Jr., for inviting me to your global conversations on race, poverty, and war. And I was also forwarded a question by the organizers of this conference. And the question was, how does the internet facilitate the embracement of Dr. King's vision of creating the World House? The internet is our modern day compass. And within it resides our own clay of wisdom. But the compass became the de facto weapon of mass destruction. It was the compass that created the Atlantic trade, slave trade, enabling the early colonial navigators and their blood merchants to charge an accurate course from Gori Ireland off the coast of Senegal to Brazil, paving the way for the transatlantic slave trade. Walk with me down memory lane. The time, 40 years ago, the setting, a refugee camp established for survivors of a war in which one million people died in 30 months. The refugees, survivors of the dance of death. My mentor, a refugee camp director, I respectfully call teacher. Martin Luther King has been killed Self teacher in a pained voice. Who is Martin Luther King? I wondered, turning towards teacher. At the time, I was a 13 year old refugee in the West African nation of Nigeria, then called Biafra. 80% of Biafras were are refugees exiled in their own country. Two years earlier, army officers staged one of the first bloody military coups in Africa. Many Nigerians felt it was a tribal mutiny of Christian peoples against Muslims. The aggrieved Muslims went on the rampage, chanting, Igbo, 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 you are no longer part of Nigeria. And in the days that followed, 50,000 Eagles were killed in street uprising. And that was before Martin Luther King was assassinated. Two and a half years. Killing was not new to us in the Africa. I was desensitized to violence because most of the refugees in our camp we are widows and orphans. Then we are survivors of the evil dance of death, a euphemism for mass execution, in which 1,000 men were ordered at gunpoint to participate in the public dance. 700 were then shot and buried en masse in a mass shallow, in shallow graves. When told to hurry up, one of the murderers said, the graves are not yet full. A few days later, possessing only the clothes on our backs, we fled from the dance of death. A year later, teacher and I were conscripted into the Biafran army and sent to the front. After the war, my teacher was among the one million who had died. 
I, a child soldier, was one of 15 million who survived. Africa is committing suicide. Millions upon millions have died in the Sudan's 20 year war, and in the genocide in Rwanda, and in the conflicts in Ethiopia, Somalia, Uganda, and Liberia. Wars from Sudan to Somalia precipitated the largest global scale surrender since the establishment of the Atlantic slave trade, which uprooted and scattered Africa's sons and daughters across the United States, Jamaica, and Brazil. Africa's wars are steering the continent towards self-destruction beyond the imagination of our greatest scholar writers. As we struggle for survival in the Africa, we didn't connect with Martin Luther King's assassination and his message of non-violence did not reach our shores. Neither did his message reach the ears of the black scorpion, Benjamin Adekunle, a tough Nigerian army commander who espoused his freedom of ethnic cleansing as follows. We shoot at everything that moves. And when we enter, when our forces move into evil territory, we even shoot things that do not move. As we hear Martin Luther King's call and march together across the world stage, let us never forget that we are in touch bearers of his legacy of peace, both for our nation and our children. And I thank the team of, Mark, of the Martin Luther King Junior International Chapel, Reverend Lawrence Edward Carter, for asking me to deliver the Walter E. Messi lecture on science and spirituality. Walter Messi and I met only once at MIT. And 30 years ago, Walter Messi was one of the few role models in physics. Someone asked, why is it that I am well known as a computer scientist, but not known well as a physicist? My answer is that computers only operate on numbers, not on abstract questions or laws of physics. So I had to develop my 18 equations to create a magical relationship between the second law of motion and the law of numbers. My numbers, 24 million equations, solved with 65,000 processors at a speed of 3.1 billion calculations per second. Each number was a bare maximum. All three numbers were world records in 1989. It was the second law of motion that breathed fire into those 24 million equa interlocking equations and set all 65,000 processors on fire, all inspired by the fire within me. God has a book of unknown knowledge. I peeked over God's shoulder and discovered that instead of using mathematics to organize the order in our universe, geophysicists violated the second law of motion and disorganized the order in all that flows underneath the earth. I passed on my discovery from God's book of unknown knowledge to humanity by introducing inertial forces into my 18 grand challenge equations, which became humanity's deepest and surest mathematical understanding of all that flows underneath the earth. I contributed the story of the second law of motion for all that flows underneath the earth. And that contribution made me a part of the story of mathematics. And I, the storyteller, became the story and the witness. 
My story, story from God's book, is about the second law of motion, which became my grand challenge equations, which became my supercomputer algorithms, which yielded 24 million interlocking equations, which made visible the infinitesimal is small, which made the invisible visible, which went into a supercomputer comprised of a union of 65,000 electronic brains, which communicated along the 12 dimensions of a 12 dimensional hypercube and over its one million communication channels, which is similar to the internet, to perform the world's fastest communication and calculation, which made happen, did not yet happen, which ended up as a headline story, occupying an original mind space in science that I will never forget. Thank you. So if you extrapolate 
one percent in, in a century. Then in ten thousand years from now, you can download the entire human brain onto a chip. And if you can download the entire human brain onto a chip, then that means you can hopefully upload it back. And if you can upload it, that means if you have a fresh body, young body, you can upload it into a young body. But that's 10,000 years. But what I think will happen 500 years is still here. Um, which is, if 1% of it's embedded in you, then you wouldn't need a computer. Because when I send an email to you, there's a computer mediated between both of us. So there are really four parts, myself and you, and the two computers. But with email, the computer will be absent. Um, because the computer will be inside us, not around us. And then we'll come directly. You have a patent for this? No, no, I, <laughs> well, I will get it in 500 years. <laughs> if you take 500 years. Yeah, I think the division of changes and how we interpret it changes with time. Each generation interprets it differently. You know, a few centuries ago, some people might think it's improper to have blood transfusion. And the Jehovah Witnesses that also think it's improper. And when you have both human transplants, some people might find it unethical or immoral. But I think our standards change with time. And the basic, what will remain the same is the basic need to survive and to improve, to improve on the physical condition of human beings. So you wear earplugs, eyeglasses, heart transplants, liver transplants, and so forth. Okay. And if you are blind, and if somebody can give you a human eyes to make you see, What's the ethics of it? As long as you know, that person doesn't need it. But does it interfere with the idea of, I guess, the higher power? Like, I mean, I, I see that when it's helping someone, then, then that's there too. But like, does it also help you play the part of God, per se? To some extent, but uh, again, how we see it. The way people will see the family years from now, I believe will be different because they get you know used to it, so it comes very slowly. And Mason also on an unmarried mission. Do you have a perspective on the theory of evolution versus as the Bible tells us God created earth and mankind? Yes. Um, well I think we, can't, we, we have to reinterpret things in the Bible, okay, in modern context, not necessarily literally. So, okay, because in, we have knowledge that people didn't have then. So you can't say because Joshua, the prophet Joshua, commanded his son not to stand still, and his son stood still for a few hours, then you cannot infer that the earth doesn't move around the sun. Okay, or if we say 7,000 years. I was created 7,000 years ago. I think we just have to, we, we should interpret everything in a literal way. I, I have two, two questions. Speaking of what, both as a scientist, I'm a mean, physicist, and also as a person <coughs> in spirituality. Um, I, you made some very two profound questions, the statements that raise the questions. One, if you can give us the insight on as your your an analogy of we as dots in an infinite being, eventually, I'll say the dots being finite, in an infinite being, eventually come, re, they re-self-create themselves 
within the infinite being. Similar, I think you were speaking in reference to the cyber, since we cyborg and eventually replacing ourselves, which leads me to the point, another point of assuming that the computer has more computing power than the human brain. I think new, new, neuroscientists are, have discovered that there's a lot more neutron, neurons in the brain deactivated, but nevertheless there, that seems to be a lot more, it provides a lot more computing power than the most powerful computer we have today. So I'm, I'm saying that's some contradiction that maybe you some insights into. I'm a little, I'm a little bit confused. Can you just take your questions? Okay. Sharp questions. Okay. Yeah, the first one, the analogy of we as dots, we the human as dots inside an infinite base. And eventually the dots begin to self or recreate themselves. Yes. And I'm trying to understand how can the dot, which is finite, yes. recreate itself within or beyond, say, the finite. Okay. Yeah. I'll explain. Uh, beyond the infinite. Beyond the infinite. Okay. I'll explain, okay? okay. You know, as a physicist and as a biologist here, if you go back three and a half billion years ago, if you were to win, um, people that believe in evolution, biologists, on the origin of life, believe that life began three and a half billion years ago. Um, when life began, you know that probably was less than an ounce if you were to weigh all forms of life. It's a, it was minuscule, weighed less than an ounce, right? About three and a half billion years ago. And today, if you weigh all the, the biomass on it, it weighs a zillion ounces. Ounces, right? Now? And what I'm trying to say, when you look at that, the growth of the biomass, it grew gradually from an ounce to a zillion ounce over three and a half billion years. And if you go somewhere in between that time period, it was less, right? Now? So what you see is that the biomass has been growing naturally in weight. And will it be infinite? I think I look at the biomass as a living organism on its own. And that which we've known over the half billion years has steadily been growing. And that mass comes from inanimate, inorganic material, they convert it to organic material. So the weight of the planet is constant, but the weight of the organic is increasing, and the weight of the organic is decreasing, right? And so what does that mean is that and common sense would say to me that have to be a balance at some point because the inorganic needs the organic to live, right? So at some point it will reach an equilibrium or plateau. And perhaps let me start going down, I might call it depth, and there might be some kind of cycle going up and down. And one thing we know is that if it spread to other parts of the evolve and spread and live in other planets, it will we we'll be to the moon, which is not like a planet, and we hope to go to Mars, which is a planet. And if we live in Mars, we will live in Mars and life will spread. So I, I think you can see with me, in a million years, people will only be a, a lunar colony and a Martian colony and other forms of life, perhaps, would evolve, start evolving. In. So what I'm trying to say, I don't think we've seen the growth, we can infer that, obviously, that it's grown. Has it plateaued? I'm not sure. I think it's still growing, but it could be there the maximum. I hope I answered your question. Um, the inspiration for it comes from my work 
in what we call massive and parallel computing. And when I talk about communication and computation being part, like the yin and yang of technology. And what I'm trying to say that the knowledge of gain from computing on the role of communication and computation shows that a system will behave like one and the internet eventually will behave like one. And the internet is literally an exercise in electronic plot. And at the same time, we also know there's a biological electronic plot that floats the earth without we know for sure. But you have to stay out of it from the moon and look at it. And you see it's a biological plot swimming in the oceans of water on earth. And the hypothesis that I put above that biological plot that encreases the earth is that they walk and they could have born. We know they interact. Okay, and what I'm saying is they interact, then they could evolve along the intervention of greater complexity and larger increasing biomass and the extent to you. Hey, before we take the next question, what are you saying to you? We have nine minutes left. Nine minutes left. Nine minutes left. Next question. Stop it. Three, switch tape. Is that the right correlation? 
Yeah, I suck. You know, I suck. Um, the body is more complex and we don't understand as much as we understand the technology. We created the technology, but we didn't create the body. Okay, so. Now that's an example. I use that as an example. It inspires us how we create the technology in our own image, but not because we don't understand the world. The computers really don't think like humans. And we make the mistake of comparing it. Okay, there are certain very basic questions you can ask. It, doesn't, it can't answer abstract questions. You can't stop for a computer, no matter how powerful it is, and say, hello, how are you today? You can answer it. A simple question you can answer. But I completely cannot answer the question, how are you today? But it operates on numbers and to perform the world's fast cal calculations, which you all humans working together can't. So that's sort of different. Uh, but we understand the computers to get back to your question because we created it. But we don't understand the world. If we can make the computer run for almost literally forever. But we can't live to live forever because we don't fully understand the world because we didn't create it. Well, can the computer help us understand the um, To some extent, it's a research tool. Uh, it, it, it's knowledge. Okay, computer allows us to gain knowledge, to acquire data and process data faster and gain more knowledge. That's a fact. Okay. So it does help us to understand. But I think there's a limit to what we can do because we created it. It can only go, but so far it's still not as smart as the human mind that created it. We have a little less than five minutes. Okay, so love is the answer. You said we're about to drop the baton. You give us our information, so what would you have a human's action be? What should our actions be when you ask a human to do what we do? As you respond to that question, I'd like you to say something about communication. You mentioned that as something very important to the internet. Mm -hmm. Can you just put that on the response? Yeah. Well, that's a very tough question. You asked me it's a tough question. Okay. And like I said, when we ask the computer if love is the answer, what was the question? And it took this exercise computer. A thousand years to answer that question. Answer. And I think I'll need to take a thousand years to, get, get, to answer that question. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Tim Perry. Yeah. Tomorrow, let's see, no, Friday at 2 o'clock. Dr. Ima Wally is going to be the guest of the science division. Where is that? Um, we have him at 3 o'clock.